Hello and welcome back to the How to Get an Analytics Job podcast. So we're going to be talking all things analytics engineering. We've got Haley Keith, our social media media manager, and Reed Williams joining us. So how are you? Hey guys, happy to be here. Glad to have you. All right, so uh, Reed, I'm curious about your past because I noticed that you didn't get a degree related to analytics. So I'm kind of curious, I mean, a little on a selfish note, because that's kind of the space that I'm in is helping people, a lot of people transition from non-analytics jobs into analytics jobs. So how did you make that transition? Were there any kind of lessons we could we could pull out of that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I have graduated from the University of Auburn down in South Alabama, um, getting a degree in psychology. It's actually technically a double major in human development and family studies as well. Um, those are very, Hey, war Eagle. That's what I'm talking about. Um, (laughs) there were a lot of times in college where I was pretty set on the idea of becoming a counselor or some type of therapist. Um, because I, I think I have a pretty good way of interacting with people and kind of hearing what they're going through and empathizing and figuring out, you know, those kind of things. But as college went on further and further, I kind of just wanted to get out of there. Um, And I know that's kind of a bad excuse, but I think at the time I just didn't really have much direction in where I wanted to go in life. And so it was, let's just get this degree, see if we want to go to, you know, get a master's in counseling or some type of therapy, you know, secondary college, um, or just kind of throw myself into the void that is the workforce. Um, And so I opted for the latter of the two and decided to uh, hit up a few friends near the end of college and say, Hey, I'm looking for a job. Uh, I don't know really what, I don't have any good hard and fast, strong skills anywhere. Pretty much just, I know how the brain works yeah. vaguely. <laughs> so I've been calling that the, uh, the quarter life crisis. So I, I teach yeah. college seniors on undergrad and um, I keep, I keep teasing them about like, you guys are like, super comfy right now and you're like worried about tests and like you know whether i'm going to understand this concept or you know the politics of of college but what you're not focusing on is like the existential crisis you're about to face when you get out into the into the world because i think um i don't know i mean i guess this is a little bit of a hot take but a lot of college degrees provide you with zero skill set yeah um we can we can go deep into that um (laughs) I think that there are some college skills that are invaluable. Um, But Mm -hmm. for me, what I saw at least in, obviously I have a very small sample size because I went to one college in one town in one state, right? right? So there's millions of different types of colleges and stuff all around the, the United States and even in the world. But from what I saw, the things that were most valuable were kind of just the learning how to do things without my parents. Um, You know, if that makes any (laughs) sense, you know, as a freshman, a lot of people, my roommate at the time had never washed his bed sheets, you know? And so like learning (laughs) those kind of things, like his mom did that for him. And so learning those kind of things are what I think inherently college is valuable for. Um, That's not to say that every degree you get in college is a useless piece of crap and should throw it, you know, out out the window. Mm -hmm. I think that you can learn some really specific skills for some really specific jobs. You know, these a lot of like these software engineering degrees and mechanical engineering or even these medical degrees are very uh, they prepare you pretty well. But I do think the beauty, at least of the software space, is everything that I can learn. I can also, if I do it correctly, I can learn it on the internet on my own. Um, right. Which, so yeah, that, that's what's so fascinating right now. It's, it's, it's exactly. interesting. Yeah. And so maybe that kind of hurts your case. I don't know. <laughs> but maybe that's something that you kind of preach in, in, in your classes. Is like one of the best skills that you can learn is how to Google the next question. You know, how can you Google that better? Um, well, so I sit at like a really interesting place kind of in the, so I've got one foot in, I run my own consulting agency. 
Um, and I also teach, but I'm also published on LinkedIn and then run the podcast. So this semester yeah. we're actually live streaming half of our lectures. So I'm like, I firmly have one foot kind of in this like digital space to where, I mean, I'm essentially giving away half of my college lectures for free. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it benefits the college though, because, um, like we, last week we had the VP of Truist come in and talk to my students who yeah. that's the world's sixth largest bank. So that like, right. it really helps boost their brand. Cause I mean, they're. Greensboro College is a very small liberal arts school in, in North yeah. Carolina. So like that, it's it's mutually beneficial, but you're right. Like I just heard Harvard, I think they went back to um, 100% remote. So it's like you're Did paying they? what, $56,000 or something like that yeah. for Zoom lectures that you yeah. could do online. <laughs> it's crazy. I've, I've even seen some lectures from Stanford about uh, like bash programming, complete lecture on YouTube for free right yeah by by sand like they're we're not no one's ripping it they're just putting it up there for people to use and consume well okay i, I will that's say this I to code. oh that's how you did oh, cool. i mean the internet um the boot camp was structured as in like there were labs and code reviews um but a lot of it was how learning how to google um, mm -hmm. learning right. how to take something and make it you know apply that same uh, thought process to your to the thought process you need to have. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I highly recommend uh, coding boot camps for anyone, degree or non degree, because it, you know it's a skill that, that sets you apart. And yes. yeah, well, uh, the 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 intangible though is the network. You know, if you go to Harvard, yeah. you're in the in group, and, and right. like that's gonna get you in the door. So th th I'm not saying it's completely invaluable. It's just it's interesting seeing the current state of education because um, it's yeah. it feels like it's shifting. And I know online, so online degrees are just blowing up right now, which is really fascinating. But yeah, okay, so how did how did how did you get into? Well, actually, what, what were you gonna say? I was just I was just agreeing with you. I think potentially it's a pretty hefty price tag to put Harvard on your resume, whereas maybe some very practical uh, GitHub code could could do kind of the same exact thing. You know what I mean? Right. Well, I think it depends on what lane you're going into. So if you're True. going into investment banking, having oh, yeah. Harvard on your resume is very important. But if you want to get a job <laughs> at in Silicon Valley, I don't think they really care too much about the prestige of your university. It's like, can you perform? Can you execute or yeah. can you not? Um, exactly. And um, yeah, that leads right into, you know, kind of how I got into more of this analytics space. Um, so after college, I just called a friend um, up in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, for a company called Shipped at the time, it had just been acquired by Target, um, so it was generating some buzz. Certainly, the only tech, kind of the main tech space in Birmingham at the time, and I wasn't super interested in that. I was just interested in a job, and so mm -hmm. he said, "Hey, you can, I can get you in the door to do customer service, answering phone calls. I can't promise that hour hours will be good, the days will be good, you know, all that kind of stuff." But I was like, "Well, hey, it's benefits." I'm in. Um, so I essentially just right after college the next day moved to Birmingham and started answering phone calls at a grocery delivery tech startup. Oh, um, gotcha. So we, we got a live chat coming in. So Christian Bordeaux is saying Fang is all about execution. So he, yeah. he totally agrees with us. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, I, I started answering phone calls, um, kind of working these pretty wacky hours late at night during the weekends. It was fine at the time because it was just a new, you know, brave new world for me. So I was okay right. with it. But after about a month of, you know, trying to apologize to people for messed up, you know, uh, grocery delivery gifts, <laughs> uh, I was like, I need to figure out the next step pretty quick or else I need to be out of here. Cause it's just kind of killing my, uh, my um, happiness essentially. And so, that was really for me, it's kind of makes it unique, but that was really the fire underneath me wanting to learn more about the tech world, just because I was kind of put in a, a bad spot where I was at. Not bad in the sense that I was certainly grateful to have a job. It was just not what I wanted to be doing. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I was looking in through a metaphorical glass window of our whole tech stack at shift that is a big was at the time a big monolithic like rails application so i was able to look in and see whoa if i write this code i can like get information back or do something with other information and so it was kind of this big mind-blowing thing for me um that 
you know, our company is a tech company. Let's see if I can get into it. Um, furthermore, it didn't hurt that my father has been a big C programmer for 50 plus years. So, uh -huh. so you're even exposed to, to that. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, to, if we rewind real quick, I actually started at, at Auburn with a computer science software engineering degree. Uh, um, but I, I'll be honest, it just wasn't cut out for college as an 18 year old. And so <laughs> I, I quickly pivoted and kind of regret it now, but at the same time, I think the knowledge I've gained on the way has been just as valuable as maybe four years of learning that at, at college. Um, so yeah, I kind of had a few people backing me up, you know, my father, if I had questions, he kind of had some answers or would show me how to use Google, um, more, more often than not. And uh, I eventually just got access to um, just like our, our read replica database. And so that kind of brought me into this analytics world of, oh, we're storing a lot of information and I can go and access it all via my computer, which is mind blowing to me, which, yeah. So that was kind of the introduction of how I got mm -hmm. integrated into kind of this analytics world was. I acquired information to get into our database. I was able to then just scour the tables and see what we had. And from there it was, I had like the stage was set. I had the database to look at, and then I had external, you know, SQL lessons that I could go learn and then apply them to a set of data. So that kind of got the ball rolling with me learning analytics and stuff like All that. Right. So I think that's the trick is application-based <laughs> education. So you can't really learn something out of a book in my, well, you can't learn something technical out of a book. Like, I'm, cause I think that's the methodology for like um, computer programming, right? Like they teach, they teach you frameworks, which I think in computer programming, that probably makes more sense. But like within the analytics space, like um, what, what I do, it, what, what I did this summer is I start, I launched my own startup. And in this class that we're doing now, I have the students studying my data and coming up with recommendations on how we can pivot. So it's like a real time. I mean, they're getting access to real data. They're getting to interface with the business owner. And then they're also like getting to see their recommendations implemented and tested whether it's effective or not. And then in exactly. this, yeah. And then in the spring semester, uh, I'm going to bring them in to work on a consulting engagement with one of my clients. So, so oh, they're wow. getting like, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like what we're doing is like really, really cool. And it, and it's like, cause in my MBA program, we had a capstone course, but the professor didn't really, they didn't know the industry and they were just like, here's a company, go work for them. And it was, uh, I don't know. It almost felt like, like daycare a little bit. Like it wasn't as, <laughs> it was, it wasn't like a real problem that had, like it was a major pay, pain point. It was almost like, here's something we don't really care that much about. Just go solve it, which is valuable in that I got to work with real data in my MBA program. But um, I, I think that having kind of that industry specific knowledge and that business acumen for that, that one specific use case. Uh oh, we got, yeah. we got Robert Robinson, one uh -oh. of our podcast super fans saying daycare. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little bit, um, Hoking. yeah. Yeah. Like they're not, yeah. it, it almost like, I, I felt almost like it, it created more of a, of a time suck than a solution for like a, a lot of these capstones are. And I mean, it's, yeah. It's tough to do because like you, you don't know the inner workings. And I mean, I also, I got to work with like Haynes brand, which is a name brand company, which was awesome. And something like really bolstered my resume, but like the professor at my MBA program didn't know the inner workings of this organization to where like I've, exactly. I've consulted for 10 months with the CEO of this agency. And I know like, here's a low hanging fruit that they just don't have time to, that could provide some really big value, which I think is right. was really cool. And, and I think that that kind of like the education piece is is valuable in the sense that I like to think of in like a tech world, you have all of these different applications that you're using, whether it's some type of SQL editor or Tableau or whatever mm -hmm. you name it. it. VS Code even is what I would I mean, it's an IDE, but it's a it's a tool. Essentially, it's a mm -hmm. tool belt or it's a thing inside of your tool belt, whereas you know, the Haynes brand in the grain of their data and stuff like that is stuff that you don't learn in college because that is insanely specific and would be a use of, it would only be useful to one person at one time. You know what I mean? So I think right. the power becomes in, in equipping yourself with the tools. So you're ready to just learn what I call the tribal knowledge of the company, right? So the knowledge that's yeah. just kind of passed down that, I wouldn't know if I wasn't there. 
And so right. I think, yeah, just sharpening those skills, sharpening, you know, I've got a sharp ax, I can cut down a tree. What do you need me to go cut down? Um, Here's what a tree looks like. A lot better mm -hmm. than I know how to cut down this one tree. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, so, yeah. uh, so I've kind of broken down how to get an analytics job into four pillars. The first one's business acumen. The second one's analytics hard skills. So it's kind of like blending those two together. Yeah. Because and that's um, Naval Ravikamp. I don't know if you're a fan of him, but he talks about specific knowledge. And like when you're young, early on okay. in your career, you just need to get experiences. Because like reading a case study on someone who is um, developing a new marketing strategy is, I, I'd say it's moderately valuable. But like being in there, having to make a judgment call in real time is that is a specific knowledge because you understand there's the, that pressure factor of well we're not seeing a return on our investment should we continue um what are the consequences of us making the wrong decision i mean that that's like a, it's a much more like visceral experience also we've got a, another super fan here or a, a chatter saying what's the goal behind today's podcast so today we're going to be talking about we're leading up to this so reed does analytics engineering which is something that i'm not i mean I, reed Tell me, is this a correct, I guess, synopsis? Data engineering has to do with like kind of ETL stuff? Yes. Right. So I'm I'm um, much more on like the Tableau. I'm basically a management consultant with a little bit of Tableau and light SQL knowledge sprinkled in. So we're 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 getting into who you are, kind of like how you got up to this space. And then right. we're gonna unpack kind of what you see the state of that specific um, lane within the analytics space is. Yeah. I think to add on to, I think in in a work context, I would be the ingestion of the data. Whereas at this point is where you and maybe these kind of people with Tableau mm -hmm. experience would be then taking that data and making the insights. And so I started in the Tableau layer and the analytics layer, and now I've moved more towards the data ingestion. Um, so that's kind of the idea of, yeah, exactly. It's the combination of a data engineer and analyst. It's um, there's, there's potentially a few more practices inside of it that, you know, revolve around things like CI, CD when, when talking about some type of Git or GitHub re repository or something like that. Furthermore, it's a bit more just kind of Python solving more problems, uh, Pythonically. Um, yes. Is so I don't know. Robert Robinson saying data engineer is the hand that rocks the cradle. Uh, can, he's, he's not on the podcast, so he can't, uh, can you unpack that analogy? I don't know what that means. <laughs> Um, you want me to, um, it's the, oh, well, it didn't make sense to you. I, if I understand it correctly, what he's saying is, uh, it's the thing that keeps the baby happy. Um, in the sense that uh, okay. we're the people that are making sure that the tables don't have duplicate rows or don't mm -hmm. have some type of error in innate error in the I table know. that you are. Yeah, exactly. So that kind of stuff. So it's the, it's the people that kind of ingest the data, make sure the data is good for other people to then use and draw insights out of. Um, gotcha. All right. So I, I don't want to pause too long on like the early stage career, but sure. so what I'm, I'm looking at your LinkedIn right now. So you, your, your first job after the research assistant, um, at the correctional facility, you went directly into an analyst role or did you have like a, a that support role and you just left it out of your, out yeah, of your... I kind of did that. Um, the reason being is because in this situation, um, I was in a support role for roughly two and a half to three months. So to me, that that little tiny sliver of time, um, it's it's in no way to like hide my, you know, my intro into the company, but more so it doesn't feel like it's the most indicative of what my my career at Shipped uh contained, if that makes sense. Well, no, but I think that's that's an excellent tactic though. Like um to get in at the ground floor show that you're a bright person and then you can get that promotion to where like you don't have to necessarily go directly and I, and you're not actually going to be able to if you're entry level and you have no skills and no experience you're not going to get your dream job at you know 22. nowhere <laughs> most likely yeah. not right so i think that i just kind of wanted to unpack because i think part of part of what we need to do more in the, the podcast is like show examples like in mental models of like how you can get into because it sounds like Reed, you really like what you're doing right now like you're in a good a good spot yeah i so really I'm to, yeah you're really what yeah um so i essentially at, at shipped was doing a lot of data analyst work um so kind of the idea that what took me 
to the next level of becoming from customer service to an analyst was um, essentially I got access to database and eventually just started answering questions for people that were otherwise kind of, I guess you could call it data blind to the problem saying, using a lot of really qualitative data saying, I think that this is going really well, or we're not seeing anyone complain about this feature in our application. So I think it's going well. Well, that's, that's pretty, that's kind of a naive mindset. And so being able to kind of supplement those people in those meetings and hear what they're saying and say, well, I wonder with my general curiosity and my shallow knowledge of SQL, can I find what they want to know relative to the, the topic at hand? And so that's where kind of the, the analysts started forming inside of me was seeing these problems that people were talking about, but no one was really backing it up with data. So and you so, created your own analytics job. Pretty much. They were already. Yeah, yeah. I think doing that's, that's things, fantastic. But yeah, it was it was kind of a so it was for a specific niche of the company, which was the operations. So making sure that we delivered groceries, making sure that groceries got delivered on time or how many grocery deliveries were late last week. We weren't really keeping mm -hmm. track of these things. And by being able to keep track of that, we're able to very quickly make, you know, some pivots to different ideas or, oh, this metro or this location is having trouble oh, there's a snowstorm. Okay. We understand, you know, kind of thing. Right, so right. Um, being able to kind of start in this operations area for analysts um, was what got me kind of hooked into being an analyst in general. All right. So we have multiple people asking now. Also shout out to Raj, who's a podcast super fans. Thanks for, thanks for being on Raj. And then um, there, and also Christian's asking, what is CICT? I was, my bad. I think I enunciated incorrectly. It's CICD, oh. which is continuous okay. integration and continuous okay. de deployment, um, which means if we're going to start putting our analytics work into production in some way, which we can talk about in, in the upcoming con conversation, because that's kind of another facet of an analytics engineer is can I production productionalize this like table for people to consume? Can I update it constantly. So by doing that, we need to have some type of um, unit tests and checks to make sure that the the data that we're going to change or the, the way that we're going to change the underlying query for a table, we need to make sure that it runs before we put it into production, right? Because if right, we're going right. to go and write a query and say, okay, this is how you can find all customers with orders. Well, what if I go and change that on the underlying code and now it breaks or now it doesn't return any results. And now everyone in, you know, finance is freaking out because there's no information about customers placing orders today. Well, in mm -hmm. this situation, CICD or the continuous integration says, I want to go make a change somewhere. And this is generally via Git. I want to go make a change somewhere to the relative piece of code. And the change that I'm wanting to push and change in make is I want to test to make sure that that code doesn't break anything else. So that's in and of itself. I know it's, it's more of a software um, practice, but in and of itself is what can allow us to confidently make changes to SQL queries or anything like that without breaking things downstream. Yeah, absolutely. I see the to the utility of that because the worst thing you can do is if you're presenting as a business analyst, like kind of further down the funnel, like you're in the ingestion and like digestion, I'm like um, right. further down that. Um, if I'm presenting something and then all of a sudden the CEO or the CMO or COO is like, well, that's absolutely wrong. Then it, yeah. shall, it sheds doubt on everything I've just recommended and presented. So exactly. yeah, it's and hugely it valuable. Yeah, so that's essentially it. It's just a unit testing type of feature. We can also implement a lot of really cool things with CICD, uh, but this is all in the context of some type of uh, version control system, which could be Git or Bitbucket or GitHub or GitLabs, which right, just so I would recently. <laughs> you, you and Haley are gonna have to take over. Uh, it's getting, it's getting, it's getting beyond my depth as far as like technical stuff. Like I am not a coder at all. So you went from data analyst into data engineer at that same organization. And now you're um, a data engineer at JetBlue. So yes. let's kick off the conversation around like, first of all, and this is a very personal, like a question that I want to know, like what, what is data engineering? You kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but maybe like unpack it a little bit further. Sure. Um, I think if we want to 
maybe grossly oversimplify what data engineering is, especially in kind of a tech world. Um, it would be the whole ETL process. And ETL okay. stands for extract, load, transform. So we take data from somewhere, load it into a database and transform it into a nice neat table for someone to use. Um, furthermore, there's other paradigms. The other one is actually E ELT, which is extract and then load into a database. And then once in the database, let's transform the data. Gotcha. Um, so uh, you want to answer Raj's question here? Sure. So yeah, what, what think, are the skills needed to move from data analyst to data engineer? Right. Um, so when you put a tag of data anywhere on any kind of role, I think SQL is imperative um, of some type. So knowing how to you know, interact with the data that you're using is innately valuable. It's like speaking English. Like if I can't speak English, we're going to have a very hard time on this podcast. I think SQL mm -hmm. in the data world is essentially that like English language. Everyone should be able to at least speak it a little bit, if that makes right. sense. So I think that's valuable for both an analyst and an engineer. I think more towards understanding how external data sources come in to a database is something that is very valuable for an engineer. Things like APIs, or if your own company is releasing microservices, you can go and ingest that data into your into your database. That would be more of an engineer's job, and that would require a bit more Python, um, a bit more kind of functional programming code, as opposed to maybe some of the visualization layers that an analyst would be more focused on. So. It's more about solving these ingestion or ETL problems as an engineer, whereas analysts are solving more business business question related problems, if that makes sense. So I've got I a question. You... Go, go, go ahead, Haley. Oh, no, you go ahead. Man. I was just talking about SQL. <laughs> well, uh, I'm just curious about as a business analyst, how much would it behoove me to learn more about like coding and structures and all that kind of stuff? Like in your organization, are they pretty much like, they're well taken care of, of like, you've got, they can just reach out to you. It, it wouldn't, it would behoove them more to focus on understanding like strategy deeper rather than the technical side. Yeah. Good question. I think that when it comes to kind of these, these programming question or like, should I learn more programming things? That's like, should I add another tool to my tool belt? That will never hurt you. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Now, no, I put that with the caveat that if you have a stakeholder that needs something tomorrow, I don't think you should be learning a, like a Python 101 course. I think mm -hmm. you should be seeing those problems. So a lot of jobs or a lot of places that people are in currently might uh, not intentionally, but negate people from having getting their hands wet in other tools like Python or just learning, you know, programming paradigms. But I do firmly believe the future of analysts will be very more towards analytics engineers. I think the bar is constantly being raised in that I know data analysts that know Python better than me. And so, you know what I mean? Like, all right, know, we're going to have a debate because okay. I have the complete reciprocal view. Oh, really? I think that it's going to be moving more and more towards no code and GUI, okay. GUI interfaces because I think but that- who's uh, making those GUI interfaces in the no code uh, layers? <laughs> Right, right. Nothing well, drives me crazy like a GUI interface. Like, yeah, right. Well, I mean that that is right. But, but think think about it in terms of like a volume of people. So people right. who are marketing specialists, marketing specialists are now using these GUI inf interfaces to now then make their decision, and that splinters out into supply chain, sales, marketing, everything. So I, I mean, I guess we're kind of talking past each other in that there is a role for people to build out the GUIs. But then I think that yeah. that scales out to even more people who are going to be using those to drive your decisions. Well, I think in that context, then an analyst in this situation, if it goes towards no code or more GUI or graphical user interfaces, if that you know rings a bell for anyone is um, analysts, I think will eventually just get phased out then because we won't need analysts to use these GUIs if they're created correctly. We can have our CEO or our CMO just click and drag on on this GUI, right? So eventually it right. doesn't, an analyst isn't needed to do that stuff. And so I think there, if that goes to no code, there would be a drastic separation and an analyst would be kind of stuck in the middle. 
All right, this is this is an interesting co conversation. I just had a meeting with um, the CEO that's going to be we're going to be partnering with in the spring for my Greensboro College cohort, and um, we were up in his like high rise corner office, and he was saying, "Oh baby, his job is to look three years out." So he's looking at he is not going to be interested in understanding a daily, weekly, monthly, even quarterly data. He has a manager who is kind of an analyst hybrid with a, the, it's like a marketing director who is, yeah, I, in a way I, I, we're, we're in agreement in that like, yeah, maybe the title analyst phase phases out, but that thinking and methodology and technical skill is going to be absorbed into just a management role. Yeah. And I think, when talking about this kind of this moving to either a GUI based or more, we need to learn more, uh, you know, tools in our tool belt, like Python and SQL and R and, you know, all these things. Um, it like, yeah, I'm trying to think about what I was saying. <laughs> I just kind of forgot. All right, um, here, let's buy. Some, so Raj is backing me up. <laughs> he said, mm -hmm. well, okay. So Raj is getting a PhD in um, geography. So he he knows like all this kind of stuff. And I guess I don't know really much about that space at all, but he's saying it's going, you know, low code or no code. But I mean, I, I think part of it is like businesses are getting so sophisticated and so big that like it's not a yes, no, it's or either or it's like I think it's like a yes and situation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I agree. And I think that reference to the Azure, you know, whole environment is correct. They've created and continually are improving their Azure cloud instance and all the things inside of there. But at the same time, Raj, I don't know if you're familiar, but Azure also has its own command line interface, which then allows me to programmatically interact with it. AKA, the other day I was uploading data to a blob storage container using Python. So I can do that via the, um, the web interface by dragging and dropping or I can programmatically upload 500 files in about three seconds using Python. So, I mean, there's, there's <laughs> trade-offs. Awesome. And I think if we do it, if we do it correctly, it, it's both, it's, it's everything to all people, right? People that want to use the GUI can use it, but also a, well, a, a company worth their salt should also have some type of API or command line interface that we can interact with programmatically as well. All right. So, so, okay. When you say worth your salt, one thing that I think we're, we're on a different, we're not in alignment with is that I work with companies that are a billion in sales or below. So like if you're okay. working with like Home Depot or Walmart or Amazon, yeah, they're going to have a robust ETL. Like they have huge amounts of data to where like, I mean, a lot of these, like, I don't know, tens of millions of revenue companies that I consult with, they're still in Excel. Like they, yeah. they, they pull things out of Excel and then we upload it into Tableau. So, Hey, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a scale thing. It's a beautiful it's, thing. It's scale. Yeah. I, I agree. I, and I think Excel just out of the box is easy to use and user friendly. I don't think that the, I don't think Excel is a bad thing. I think when people talk about <laughs> analytics and that kind of stuff, it is kind of this joking, um, oh, these people are stuck in Excel or that kind of thing. It's this kind of people have this kind of stigma around these, you know, sheet based applications, which are infinitely valuable. As you talk about with these companies, they that's what they use. It's their language. You have to learn to speak it. You know what I mean? And well, so it's a data de democratization tool. Yeah. To where like to, there's a huge barrier of, of entry to do what you do as an analytics engineer. To where, like, I mean, it's like, you're right. Like, it's like learning a language. Like, you have to learn, like, the simple nouns and verbs. And then you need to understand, mm -hmm. like, for example, you, you sprinkle, sprinkle in something nuanced like humor. Like, now you're, like, you, that's something that is culturally specific to wherever you are. And I, I think mm -hmm. that kind of metaphor works to, like, when you're out in the wild and you're having to do ETL for a company, it's like, well, you know, in 2018, we tracked orders this way, but then we switched in 2019. So knowing that very specific nuance point is, I mean, it's like that. I, I love that term tribal knowledge because I think that really, really applies. Yeah, you're right. And, and so that's, that, yeah. Like knowing how to make um, data talk, like different data sources talk to one another. Like that's something that, that that's a skill that travels. You know, like I don't yeah. know how you. Yeah, Haley, what was your question on SQL? 
Oh, nothing. I was just going to say I love it pretty much. We can skip past that. So wait, what's, what's your what's your experience? Because like I, I know how to take someone else's SQL code and modify it to like basically reappropriate it for my use. But like I don't really. I mean, understand. pretty basic stuff. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say I'm any sort of expert or master. I wouldn't even I'm going to just uh, aim comfortably and say, you know, I'm OK. Gotcha. Yeah. Done. All right. So Rod, Rod is very interested in this conversation. Do you so think that all or most of the companies will move their database infrastructure to cloud like Azure or AWS? And thank you so much. We're getting about the lecture for free. Hey, no problem, Raj. I enjoy the conversation. Um, so the question was, do, do you think that most companies are going to be moving towards cloud-based environments when it comes to their data? Um, I'm unsure. I think it'll be a case by case basis by company because there are there are certain costs with maintaining your own relational database like Postgres or MySQL um, in your own company. But there are also costs to owning a cloud environment via maybe um, a, a AWS's. I don't remember their cloud environment, their cloud databases, but they have them. And then Snowflake would be the obvious other one that is also cloud based. Um, we have BigQuery as well and, and things like that that are becoming more into open source. But I think that there are trade-offs for both. I think a company has to evaluate that themselves. I think um, just by the simple compute power that cloud-based SQL uh, databases have, that it is the right call moving forward. Um, but that's, you know, that's a very blanket statement for you know, every company has very niche problems and very niche data. And they might not need a cloud-based environment that can aggregate billions of rows at seconds, you know, that that might not just be the point of what they need. And so if we're talking about companies in an analytics perspective, I think these cloud based databases are the exact correct way to go, because it allows analysts to write queries at lightning fast speeds. Um, so Gotcha. All right. So let's we're circling back around. Christian's got another question on is CD CICD a framework or a program? Sure. Uh, CICD is technically a programming concept. So the way that you achieve it is different however you want to do it. So it's kind of like um, race, like I like driving a car. Well, uh, there are multiple different ways to drive. There are multiple different cars to drive. They're all the same concept though. That is four wheels and an engine. CICD is like the concept of a car. Whereas, you know, maybe the way that you would implement this, this kind of idea or the thing that you want to do is via whatever language you feel comfortable doing it in. This also revolves around, heavily revolves around a version control system. So I think we would have to kind of step, take a step back from CICD to understand what version controlling your code looks like. Um, so I don't know if that's in the conversation, but that certainly is very valuable for an analytics engineer. I mean, you can talk about it. It's like way over my head. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 was say. I don't know if that's what we want to talk about because it would be, <laughs> not be a good conversation. <laughs> but I'm right. happy to, you know, ask the question. Okay, so Shashank's asking some question about like kind of how to um, get into uh, hit, the space of data engineering. So Shashank, I don't know if you've just tuned into the live chat, but we we just had Reed's Batman origin story of how he got into the analytics space, became a data analyst, then a data engineer, and then upgraded it to another data engineer position. So, but I still think that this is a good question, like a foundational question of, so Shashank's asking, hello all, I'm a beginner and looking forward to start my journey towards data engineering. I need some insights to start my journey. journey. Uh, courses or platforms where I can get my hands on some data. So do you have any recommendations there? Sure. Um, yeah, great question. And one thing that I, I actually encountered this last week, um, my, my brother-in-law reached out and said, look, I'm looking to make a new change into the programming world. And I was like, okay, that's cool. But that's pretty much like going to a music teacher and saying, Hey, I want to learn music. Like you, you need to figure <laughs> out what Avenue there's genres, there's instruments, there's things. So Flavors. it exactly, there's different flavors of music. Some make me sad, happy, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I think it, the the first step is really narrowing down, um, maybe from listening to podcasts like this or reading blogs, what is inside of the title of data engineering? What are the things that get you most excited? 
and then start to quantify the or like start to block those things together is it solving the mathematical programmatic problems or is it learning a new language or is it you know whatever it may be i think it's really good to start by kind of pinned to the paper saying what do i what do i think it is and how can i you know go forward from there so that's kind right, of a, i think uh, yeah i think it's kind of a trial and error thing of um thinking that you might like something then getting your hand like rolling your sleeves up getting your hands dirty but i think um a good framework to think about is if you are passionate and, and genuinely intrigued and curious and excited to wake up and do something every day over a 30 year period, you're not just going to be like twice as good as the person who is drudgery for them. You're going to be exponentially better at it because it's like, and I, I, I'm kind of like feeling that now in that I'm getting deeper and deeper into kind of the analytics industry. And what I like to do is I like to talk to people um, I'm interested in like high level concepts. I mean, and I can bring people like you and Reed who can like get super specific about the thing you care about. And it's like, you are the person to talk to about this. Cause like, I mean, you could, you could wake up in the middle of the night and I can ask you a question and be like, yeah, it's this, like, you don't have to like think about it and write it down. Maybe research. It's like, you've got a fingertip feel for this space. That's simply because I've had a curious brain, I think. Um, and so that's, if I can give a piece of advice, it's to be curious and to not be afraid to look up things on the internet. That's how I learned. That's how every, it's just a knowledge share. And so figuring out how to look up Python problems or something like that. Cause if you do want to move into a data engineering role, I would highly suggest Python. Um, it is pretty much the, it's so easy out of the box to write in that it becomes so universal for everyone to use. Now there's, obviously pitfalls with Python because it has, it's slower than other languages, but it's very nice for data engineering roles. It's, it's gonna get integrated in that. But at the same time, I resonate with you on that question because it is difficult to just go and take a course on your computer because there you're solving hypothetical problems. Whereas in a company context, when you need to get from point A to point B using whatever you wanna do, that becomes fun. But when they're saying, hey, try to print hello world, it's like okay, well, this is not <laughs> this is not showing me anything about this language. You mean that's so, gonna give me a job? Yeah, it <laughs> might if you if you <laughs> if you frame it right, I guess. <laughs> nah, I don't, I don't right. think it will. There's no way. Yeah, I think obviously the obvious answer too is learn a bit about a language and then figure out a problem that you want to solve and try to try to just do it. Um, I've written some code that will take music off of the internet and will put it on my computer nice and neatly with all this metadata and. It was just a fun project I wanted to do on my own, but it's also a way for me to show my work to future employers and say, hey, here's what I, you know, I actually can do what I say I can do. Check it out. Um, so creating some type of passion project or some type of cool thing that you can find on the Internet and then create, you know, a project, put it on the Internet, save it so other people can see it later on is a very valuable effort. So Gerson, actually, he's going to be coming on. Um... He's going to be on our, our, our Tuesday Greensboro College class live stream. So he just took our um, Tableau Quick Start course. And oh, I yeah. would say if you if you want a good like first step into building a passion project, Tableau Public is the way to go. So they the Tableau Public is the free version of Tableau. And what you can do is you can upload whatever work you've done to your Tableau Public portfolio. I've actually heard of hiring managers asking to see your Tableau Public portfolio before mm -hmm. you even step into an interview. So I, I think that the passion project is hugely important because you're right. Number one, it shows that you can effectively execute. But number mm -hmm. two, it also gives you a conduit to have a conversation. So like, mm -hmm. let's say that you care about environmental science. Maybe you could pull in some CDC data or environmental data and visualize yep. like the impact of climate change or food deserts or whatever. I mean, it's it's really kind of a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to play and kind of cap capitalize on that curiosity that you have. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I remember back in, in high school, I would get Fs on my math test because I wouldn't show my work, you know? <laughs> and and right. they were just like, you can't just put 15. You need to show me how you made 15. And it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, I can, I'm good at data engineering. Well, you can't just say that. You have to like, <laughs> you have to show me what you're doing to, to for me to understand that. And so I think that that's a very valuable thing. Um, Heading, thinking about the Tableau side of things, 
I want to hear your opinions on what do you think, like, how do you think the data should be brought into Tableau? Haley, do you want to, you want to answer? I know. I, I know. I don't know anything about Tableau. Okay. All right. So um, the way that ideally, so I just landed a new client that they actually had an, uh, an analytic, they, I guess they had a data engineer come in and build out an automated uh, inf ETL infrastructure. So what we're doing is all we're doing is connecting to their Tableau server and then building out the infrastructure so the uh, top level executives can make better decisions. So that's the ideal, like they have, like, I guess it's APIs and it's all, I mean, they, they just, we, we signed this new client and they were just like, here's our data structure. And it's like that, like, so we, we had um, kind of like a data model they sent us of like, you know, here, here's the definition and it was all laid out. I, I don't usually, this is the first time I've had a client that was this like seamless. It was just like a layup. It was so easy for us to just have a huge win for them. Um, but most of the time it's Excel. So I'm pulling Excel in and luckily it can be a little sloppy in that like, so Tableau likes it, likes the data to be, what is it? Tall, not wide. Um, so, and also too, like, for example, if there's two lines of metadata on the first two rows, Tableau typically doesn't like that, but you can toggle on the data interpreter tool, which will, I guess it uses, I don't know, is, is it AI? It uses some program to look at the data and say, oh, the top two rows are not, like it'll say like whatever, you know, financial statement and then the month or the time period and then the data starts with the columns across the top. So you can, you can, it's gotten better and I've actually not really delved too deeply into Tableau prep, but I know that that's yeah. like essentially Altrix where it's, it's, it's a GUA, it's like ETL GUAfied. Yeah. So, it's, its, own, uh, it's on its own Tableau application, isn't it not? The right. Right. Which I, I think is a weakness in my opinion, because Power BI, what I, I, when I'm teaching um, kind of intro to analytics to students, I start with Power BI because everything's baked into the interface. So you have your reports mm -hmm. view, you can toggle down to the data to see each individual data source. And then there's a data model view. So there you can kind That's of, beautiful. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a logical layout, and I think that's kind of the the essence of the difference between Tableau and Power BI. Power BI is very I almost want to say cold and methodical. Like it's it's like very it's like very square, mm -hmm. which has its benefits because it's so much easier for you to connect to multiple data sources. To where where it lacks, I think, is the data visualization capacity to where Tableau mm -hmm. is much more, it's almost like the difference between PC and Mac, you know, yeah. like, like Mac Relate is for between like, Gmail and Outlook. I right. Guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's like the, yeah, the company crazy. ethos with Microsoft of like, it's just mm -hmm. a little drier to where Tableau, I mean, you, I don't, you've probably seen these, these visualizations on um, LinkedIn. They're just they're It's almost like art. Some of these yeah. are so oh visually striking. Yeah. There's a, they call them what Zen masters or something like that. These people. Yeah. Tableau, Zen Tableau masters. dashboard. Yeah. I, I, when I was at Shipt, we had to, as analysts, we were using one uh, BI tool to show our information, which was called Chartio, which was an even more, it was a web-based place where I could mm. insert SQL into the web browser, essentially, and then make a graph. Now, oh, we're talking wild. about, we're talking about primitive graphs, like, we're, like bar graphs. That's about as good as we get. Um, it served the purpose, but then we decided to rotate to Tableau. Well, that means that meant for us that we needed to go and convert, you know, 400 Chartio dashboards into Tableau workbooks now. And so we spent, you know, a lot of hours of the day yeah. building Tableau dashboards to replicate what we were doing in the prior dashboard. Um, so I have familiarity with Tableau, but I don't know much about Power BI. Um, one question for you, though, to kind of strengthen the fact about analytics engineering and data engineering in general is we, we you pretty much made a really good nod to the case for data engineering in an analytics world, which is um, you, you were talking about your new client and how they built a really nice pipeline to automate that data into Tableau. Right. Mm -hmm. right, right. That That's exactly where the data engineer works. And then the analyst or the you know BI analyst there takes that and runs with it. You know what I mean? And so that's mm. where the handshake between the two people really makes sense in an analytics context. Right. And I think that it's just a different stack of skills to where like, mm -hmm. 
you're not interface. I mean, I, I, what, what's the, uh, you remember office space from like the early 2000s or 1990s where the guy's freaking out. Yeah. He's like, I talk to the client. So the engineers <laughs> don't have to, I feel like I'm that guy. Exactly. <laughs> like exactly. Getting fired. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, I would say it's more nuanced than that. Like I am turning their, their thought process. Like, like it's almost like, yeah, it's like a questionnaire of like, all right, what is your most important KPI? What are se some secondary KPIs? What are some different ways that we could visualize them so that you can have better informed data informed decisions. So mm -hmm. we're just kind of taking that conversation and building out like a blueprint for them. And I mean, I've, I've done this for the past five years where uh, I will, and it's, it's interesting because like I have a sales background. So before mm -hmm. I went back to get my MBA, I sold insurance for three years, which was hundred percent commission. And it was, uh, that, that was my quarter life crisis right there. I mean, I pulled okay. it out and developed some skills, but man, oh man, getting rejected 20 times a day, every day. Uh, I, I learned to be a little bit more verbally nimble and um, kind of proactively listen more, which is a different yeah. skill set than being super technical. It's, it's kind of like, um, I'm thinking about putting together this survey and including them in my courses, like of where on the analytics spectrum do you exist? And one of the questions is gonna be, are you more interested in people or are you more interested in things? If you're more interested mm. in things, you should probably be more on the engineering side. But if you're interested in people and kind of understanding their 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 pain points, and also maybe like on a psycho psychological level of how do you ingest information? For example, the way that a CFO ingests information is usually very they've lived the past 30 years in Excel. So they don't want a bunch of really colorful starburst charts. But when I'm working yep. with the marketing, like a, a chief marketing officer, they love that. And it resonates with oh, them. Yeah. It's like a little bit more of a creative um, space for them. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of nuance that goes into presenting the information and like really being like actively listening and empathetic to, because the big thing that I struggle with is adoption. I, mean, I, I, I shouldn't say adopt. I don't struggle with it. I'm killing it with that in that like, I basically build out this like simple, um, it's almost like a Trojan horse of a dashboard that mm -hmm. I, it's like a simple sales dashboard and I get them like one or two insights. And then all of a sudden they just, just the floodgates open and they ha hit me with like, well, what if we looked at state by time by d this demographic? And then all of a sudden they start using it and then it gets, it kind of gets their uh, creative juices flowing, but that requires that, that empathy and that reading people. And I mean, a little bit of technical skills like yeah. later, in there, but not, not as much. I think revolving around what you just said, there was two things that I think are insanely valuable that I learned as an analyst, which was one, and maybe this isn't the case for everywhere, but if you build it and you build it well, people will come. Like, you know, if you, if you do something well and you say, hey, here's this thing and it's good, mm -hmm. people will use it. People will adopt it. You know what I mean? Like you're talking about the adoption. And then, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I want to add a point to that. I think it needs to be calibrated because I think that this is a trap that a lot of super technical data scientists fall into. They spend two weeks just pouring over this, um, this, this insight that they're emotionally invested in, but mm -hmm. it, in, in terms of moving like the business needle, it moves um, sales up by 0.0001%. But yep. it was like this hugely technical feat that they pulled off. And it's like their ego investment is in, being the smartest guy in the room, not actually listening to what everyone else's pain points are. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. And I think that a lot of times I even kind of faltered in that being completely transparent where I would get so wound up in solving this problem that like in the grand context of the actual problem, I'm like just wasting time almost. I'm not listening to what the user end user needs. I'm trying to solve the problem that I see at in front of me kind of thing. You know, I have some thoughts on that actually. You're bringing solutions, not uncovering them. Yeah. Well, you know what I think it is? Uh, cause, cause something that I've noticed, so we've done like 150 podcast episodes at this point mm -hmm. and I've been in a space for like a good, a good while. The thing that I see over and over again is this prioritization of hard skills over soft skills. And I think mm -hmm. that, there is this ethos of like, oh, if I'm just technically amazing, then that's going to guarantee me a job. And I think it's because right. it's it's much easier to quantify, like, do I know Python? Do I know SQL? Do I know X, Y, and Z? To where like being able to read people, that's like gushy and hard to quantify, you know? 
Yeah. And that's valuable in any context, especially in this kind of analytics world where people can be, there's always going to be someone smarter than you, but you can do your best to listen and hear what the stakeholders need and what they care about and cater your actions towards that. I think though, personally, I think that that is kind of the job or the, the, the onus is kind of put on the manager for that kind of stuff. I don't know if you would agree. Uh, not to say that. that the, so in these situations in the past where I would get so fixated on a, such a small problem that would move the KPI needle like 0.0%, um, 0 0.01, whatever. Um, I would have my boss who, you know, is checking up on me, maybe on our one, one-on-one -on -one, he's asking me, how is things going or how she's how, asking me, how are things going? And I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm really close to solving this problem. That person, if for me in the past has been very good to say, okay, Reed, good job. It's not going to move the needle. We need to move to the next piece. And I need to, like you said, get rid of like the ego of me solving this problem and say, you're right. I'm borderline wasting time. Let's go solve the real problems. And so having someone come and almost give it to you straight as a manager, I think would say, Hey, this isn't a productive use of our time. We're getting bogged down now. Um, is good at least for you know the introductory analyst that is you know trying to solve these problems without realizing well does this move the needle or is this a value add to the company? Or even if you're kind of using like that. Scrum and Agile methodology, like um, you know if if that were the case, like someone would see that like stories weren't getting you mm -hmm. know, that like that things weren't getting getting worked through. So yeah, I um, as the person who loves to hone in on what all then feels like the most, uh, the tiniest of details, you know, sometimes it's not the right detail, but yeah, no, I agree. So wait, Reed, what was your question though? Is it's, it's the onus is on the manager to do that? That was, to, that was kind of my point that to an extent. Yeah, but I, I obviously put a caveat that it's, <laughs> it's not, it, completely the manager because they have their own set of problems to solve. But right, I think that, that right. is one person that can really, that is hands on to you in my personal work that can say, Hey, what you're doing is a waste of time, or it isn't the right thing to be doing right now. Let's pivot. Um, they can at least break you out of that. Uh, you know, eyes are swirling. You're just like tunnel vision. Zombified trying to, yeah, exactly. The tunnel vision. Right. No, I, th I think that that is the responsibility of a good manager, but also too, it's the responsibility of a good manager to hire people who have good judgment. I think True. that applies much <laughs> more in like senior, like more senior or mid to senior level roles. Cause I mean like a, an entry level analyst is going to have no judgment. You know, it's like, I've never seen any of this stuff before. Exactly. And they're just like, their job is essentially just to ingest all of it and try to make sense what they can and slowly kind of, kind of eke out their, their knowledge base. But once you and this this is something that I'm actively trying to cultivate in that, um, you know, I, I, I struggled to get my consulting agency established for five years and I couldn't say no. I think that this is the key here. Mm -hmm. Saying no to things like when you're earlier on in your career, you can't say no because you don't have any options. But then once you yeah, get to a point scary. where. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm real, so I, like I'm looking at my board right here. I have six major projects running consecutively right now. If I were to take on a seventh project, the quality of work on all of those would suffer. So mm -hmm. it's it's such a weird shift to go from this like kind of scarcity to an abundance mindset. Um, mm -hmm. I can't afford to say no to if you say yes one more time, you're going to start losing more than you would if you would yeah. say no. And it's a hard thing because you you don't want to turn anyone down because in a you know an analytics position i've had multiple times where people would send me a request we need to find this piece of information can you do it and it's like oh they're sending this to me on slack right now as like a friend um let's see if i can just knock it out and then i spend the next hour doing it when i have work slated to be solved but i don't want to you know not deliver and then prove myself not worthy in the future and so it is kind of a hard thing. It's a hard balance between these ad hoc requests and maybe your Jira tickets that are, you know, dis distributed to you. Would you well, say I think so? That's a conversation on on boundaries of like, because um, what you do, because think about it like this. So say someone sends you a, a Slack message and you drop everything you're doing and immediately work on their product problem. And let's say that happens three times. You set the precedent that 
oh, this person isn't busy and I can just tap them for work whenever I want to. So like yeah. setting the boundary of like, hey, I've got X, Y, and Z going on. Um, I could potentially get this back to you within three three or four days or however long mm -hmm. you, you, you think the project could take. Um, but I mean, that gets back to that like interpersonal soft skills. Because yeah. um, I, th I think the thing here too is um, uh, social capital. So like if you are working on projects that are on top of the work you're doing, that might gear you up for a promotion or a lateral move into a job you like even better. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's a tough one because it's like, I, I, I think that you need somewhat of like a kind of like a foundation to make those decisions. Like if it's an interesting problem and it's kind of like fun for you to solve that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you could take the evening to work on that. But if mm -hmm. you have a deadline and it's like during working hours, it, although, I mean, I, I have the worst like shiny object syndrome in the world. I think most mm -hmm. entrepreneurs do. Yeah. Like there's so many like juicy yeah. opportunities that I just don't want to say no. Cause you're right. It's like, well, I don't want to hurt that relationship that might come back in the future. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes so. you can't, you, you got to not be afraid to do that and hope that in the future they're not hurt and will come back to you when the time's right. Um, I think you're right about the boundaries. I think there's a fine line between it's kind of that, I don't know if you've heard about that productivity habit where like, if you see something that you can finish in two minutes right now, like making your bed or something, just go do it, right? It's it's mm -hmm. just like, it's at max gonna take two minutes, just do it, spend two minutes to go solve that thing. And I think in an analytics kind of ad hoc mm -hmm. perspective, when they're saying, I need to, how many people were, you know, how many orders were created last week? Okay, well, will that take me X amount of minutes to solve? Can I do that real quick? If so, I'll just go pop it out. But you have to kind of find that boundary of like, would this be more than a 15 minute endeavor? If so, we might need to push back and say, go make a Jira ticket for me or something like that. I think you're completely right. right. Yeah. I mean, it, it is it is hard to say no to people. I don't I, I'm I'm still, I'm getting better at it because I've, I've actually turned down quite a few opportunities within the past month. But it's, it's well, it's, it's such a weird thing of like, you, you have nothing to work on or like, like when you're starting out and you don't have any skills, you want any project you can. Cause it's like, this is mm -hmm. going to be hugely valuable, but then you get to a critical mass where you're seen as the go-to expert in your organization. And then all of a sudden everything comes funneling to you. And then, yeah, I, I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a tricky riddle to solve, but um, I think this is interesting. Go ahead. I think in an ar argument for kind of an analytics engineering perspective is can I essentially automate my own work? Or this is more just a general analytics question in the sense, and we can tie it back to Tableau here because I think you speak that language a bit better, is mm -hmm. can I create a wide enough data source in Tableau that will allow me, well, that, no, that will allow the stakeholder that's going to reference this dashboard, will it, will it allow them to answer all of their questions or 80% of their questions without me ever having to be a part of it again? As long as right. the data is getting in there, letting, they call it self-service analytics, right? Where we have these BI tools and we can let our stakeholders, the people that care, create their own analytics by giving them the right tools and kind of creating the guide rail saying, here's your data. Here are the filters you can select. Here's the date ranges. Here's the different tabs. Have fun, have a field day, go put that in whatever you know presentation to the CEO that you want because we built it, we trust that the data is good. And you now are just going and clicking and figuring out the answers that you need specifically with that data. You're hitting on like a huge career hack, in my opinion, which is systems <laughs> thinking. Like the difference between ad hoc versus systems thinking. Um, Cause systems thinking can scale. Like if you can yep. scale your thoughts or your, you know, whatever your work you're doing, I mean, that, that can just supercharge your career. Because then all of a sudden you build this one really thought out, well-structured dashboard. And then maybe that executive shares it with his director or another department. And then all of a sudden, like you've done this one thing really well and it's reached, you know, a bunch more people than just, well, it's, it's, it's okay. It, man, that's like a three-dimensional thing because it can reach multiple people, but it's also, it can be updated. You know, it's not it's like reusable. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's kind of how Modular, I got into analytics. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I, my first internship in my, or I should say my last internship in my MBA, 
uh, I essentially signed up for a analyst internship for someone in undergrad, like a sophomore or junior. But I showed up to that interview with an alternate pitch and I said, hey, look, you you need someone to do a, a line review for your manufacturing firm. What I can do is I can automate this process over the next three months for you. And I am still paid on retainer for that client to this day. And that's been almost six years ago at this point. So that exactly. that is hugely valuable. You hit the nail on the head. And what I think is valuable for an analyst to start gearing their mindset towards, which is how can I start automating or what you're calling the systems thinking of, I don't want to do the ad hoc stuff. You're talking about these, the, the direct relationship here is that people build the data pipeline into the Tableau dashboard board. We don't ever have to worry about uploading data anymore. It's just as there, right? But mm -hmm. you, on the other hand, with the Excel sheet, what happens when you're sick? What happens when your computer breaks? What happens when you don't work there anymore? Someone else has to go and learn exactly that exact same thing that you did to go replicate what just happened, right? And that right. is where I think that's the pitfall of analytics is these that's when we get into people rolling their eyes and scoffing about Excel is it is kind of just a point in time on someone's computer piece of data. But if we can generalize that data so everyone can reference it with the same exact results, we achieve exponentially more value with that piece of information. Right. So it's analytics same. at scale at that point. Yeah, pretty much. How can we engineer our analytics to automatically solve the problems for us? Well, what's interesting is like on the point of scale is I'm, I'm, I'm moving away. I actually have my intern who is now starting to step up and manage these consulting projects because uh, my learning platform that I've developed, that is scalable income. So I create this course one time and then I can sell it mm -hmm. 50,000 times to where like the consulting right. engagement is such a high, like intellectual investment. Like I have, I've got to figure out, all right. Well, all right, what data am I working with? Number one, I have to sign the client. I have to like close the deal, which can take mm -hmm. months sometimes and a lot of energy. But then also I've got yeah. to figure out what are the internal politics, where the data source is coming from, what's wrong with the data. Um, it's, it's, it's not scalable, but I think that from a brand position, it, it, it behooves me to have some consulting engagements still up and running because I – you know, I mean, I, I think that's the plight of education is that, you know, your professor might have made uh, a mark in his space or her space 15, 20 years ago, and they have not kept fresh, <laughs> Yeah, which is something I, you, you see often, that's, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a point I, I was thinking about as well, which is I, in college, worked, I, I played on an ultimate Frisbee team, um, and we, we were all serious, and we practiced all these times a week, and we had a coach, and our coach said something to me that stuck with me for forever. I have all these quotes that I just like live by. And this one is hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. It's like, it's a riddle, but if you think about it, that's not always the case, but you're talking about maybe kind of these older antiquated people that they're established in their career. They've done these things, but they're not learning Docker. They're not learning these new things that are happening. These can, you know, the way that software is progressing and the way that analytics is progressing is the nature of it is to be quick and to be fast and learn the next thing. And if people, you know, it, that's, I think a, a very good kind of caveat to analytics is things are evolving quickly. Like the space is very new. And so oh, yeah. there aren't set in stone. There are kind of these historical things like Excel and stuff like that, but things are changing so quickly now that, you know, everyone um, needs to be working hard to figure out the new thing or else you're, potentially might get left in the dust or get stuck at, you know, a company that you don't enjoy because you know exclusively their things. You become right. automated. <laughs> yeah. All right. Christian Bord or Christian Bordeaux says, yeah, I just interviewed for a fang and they required a tableau public portfolio. So and this is also too what I love about this podcast is that my audience is very quick to correct me if I'm wrong and then show me evidence of like I'm kind of heading in the right direction. So I think I think Tableau is, <laughs> yeah. is a fantastic piece of personal branding. And also, I mean, that's it's because you can learn Tableau like the you can be functional in Tableau in a week. I mean, you can't with mm -hmm. like the data engineering stuff. I mean, realistically, how long would it take to become a data engineer or an analytics engineer? It depends on the problems that you're solving, what your background is. But I think, you know, there are 
teams, there are companies right now, I don't know if you're familiar with DBT, which is called a data build tool. It's a Python built package that allows people to write templated SQL. It is the reason I got into analytics engineering from analytics. Um, it, they're teaching, you know, uh, 10 week long courses to teach people oh. how to be an analytics engineer, learning things like bash, the Git terminal tableau or looker, um, and then SQL. So I, I think really it, you can applicable, applicably, that's not a word, uh, <laughs> take you about class if you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay. So you can yeah, get, I, take a two week boot camp to get an entry level analytics engineering job. I, yeah. I haven't oh, taken wow. it myself. I've, I've watched and I know the people that are doing it and I know they're fantastically uh, smart and they're good at presenting data and they're good at presenting, you know, materials. So I know that it's a worthwhile investment if that's what people want to do. Um, but that, that's one way you can do it. You can also just learn by reading docs, you know, <laughs> it's kind of boring, yeah. but that's, that's kind of what, what, what kind of makes the money when, when wanting to learn a new software position is, you're gonna to have to go through the trenches of boring things sometimes. All right, so Christian just asked how long I've been in analytics. So I think I've been in analytics, well, okay. We, I, I can say five years I have been run, running a consultancy where I've been working with um, C-level executives on, on, on implementing analytics for them. Uh, seven years if you count my MBA with a concentration in analytics. And I think this is kind of an interesting point. Um, Reed, one of the questions we often get is, Okay, it, how 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 can they ask for like one to three years or three to five years for an entry level job? And the kind of like yeah. solution we've been prescribing is, well, you can count classes that you have, you can count volunteer projects, and you can count internships. So, I mean, is that do you feel like that holds any water, or would you say that it's just a weird hiring practice? Um, I think it's an antiquated hiring practice. I'll be honest. Uh, I think. Anytime I were to ever look at jobs, um, just to see like, oh, you know, Fang's hiring, what kind of language is this job using? I want to go see. And it'll say, you know, eight to 10 years of C programming. And, it, and I'm like, well, okay, that doesn't deter me. Um, okay. Well, it's the fact that I don't know C, but hypothetically eight to 10 years of SQL. Well, that's, I would have been having to do that when I was what, 15, you know, or 17. <laughs> so that obviously doesn't match, but I do trust myself and my capabilities with whatever they're asking. And I think I can prove what I've done. So it's, it's kind of like, a, I don't know if you go to a consignment shop and they say, you know, this table is $250, but if you walk in with cash and have 200, they'll probably let you have it because cash talk, you know what I mean? Like they said <laughs> right. 250, but if you had cash, like they might take a little bit less. So it's like, if you have other skills that beef up, you know, your resume or something like that, the lack of years of experience might not be as valuable as people might put the weight towards it. Right. Cause I, I think that it's how many years you've been doing it is somewhat arbitrary because you might not yeah. be doing it. Well, you may not, you may be really <laughs> bad at it. Exactly. <laughs> like there's no quality yeah. metric there. <laughs> right. All right. I so worked this... at one company for eight years and like, I'm not really learning that much, I guess. Right. Okay. All right. So this is a newcomer. So Brandon Gillis or Gillins, <laughs> Uh, I'm wanting to go into a data analyst career as a high school mathematics teacher. How can I leverage my experience into data? I have a lot of insights into this, but Reed, I want you to start. Actually, I think I doing. don't, I don't have super much, but uh, my initial thought is, are you wanting to solve problems or are you wanting to teach other people beginning, beginning level data information? So, um, I'm, I'm a little unsure, but I guess as a high school mathematics teacher, you're probably teaching algebra and calculus, which when we get into the nitty gritty of how data structures work, which is more of a computer science um, area, uh, it could prove very useful. Um, though I will say, huge caveat here is um, people have abstracted a lot of mathematical problems. So you can use just simplified functions. Um, that means if I want to calculate a p-value of some, you know, machine learning model, I just call P dot calculate or something like that. I'm not writing the F over subdivide Y square root sign. You know, it's, it's just doing that for me in the background. And so I do think the idea of understanding the mathematics behind things is valuable, though a lot of programming languages have 
um, the programming languages are pretty geared to people that aren't super mathematically heavy. Um, so, all right. So he he hit on what I was gonna was gonna get at is that Brandon, you are already essentially doing uh, functionally doing an yeah. analyst job. So you're you're taking data, analyzing it, doing math or whatever. I don't know what you're teaching specifically, um, but then presenting findings. And you're also up in front of a group of people, so that means you have strong communication skills. Which uh, I, I would lean very heavily as that's your brand position is that I am an effective communicator. Uh, I talk day in and day out. Uh, like just like what you said, I'm I'm taking very complex concepts and simplifying that so anyone can understand. That's essentially what I do in my consultancy. I take these like massive swaths of data, identify problems, pull it into Tableau, build out an infrastructure that you know, like essentially like a you know a monkey in a sp spaceship could just like click and use it. Like it's not that that concept of taking hugely complex things and distilling it down to make a decision is. I would say at the essence of what I do. And these decisions are worth millions of dollars. So um, one thing that I, I would suggest is getting into Tableau public. Like uh, and we, we do, we did just launch that Tableau quick start course. So for 25 bucks, you can get a lecture on the, the three different like functions of Tableau. You get a real data set. So I actually pulled data from my own startup for you to you get to work with, but I think that you're you're already. I, this seems like a pretty simple pivot. I don't I don't know, Reed. And also, he's so he's saying everything from calc to stats. So I mean that that means that you're versatile. That you're not. You know. I mean, it it sounds like you've got. So thank you. By the way, sadly, you have to go. Prep is over. Um, all right. So yeah. I would look into Tableau. I think that is like a super low hanging fruit. Um, yep. All right. I'll get off of my pedestal, but. Uh -huh. um, no, I think, I think Tableau is an insanely valuable tool always because it allows people to visualize data and, you know, as an yeah. analyst and in, in this kind of space, that is, that is the end all be all, right? We, we can't just have numbers in a spreadsheet. People need to see what those numbers mean. And so being able to diagram and graph it is valuable. Right. I mean, I would say SQL is, uh, SQL is also up there. And it's funny because I don't have that foundational knowledge. And I, I will be the mm -hmm. first to admit that I'm not super strong in SQL. But um, I, I, I guess I should, I should caveat that. If you want to get into a larger organization, so like a billion, billion in sales plus, something like that, they're probably going to be using databases. If they're in that smaller, smaller niche, you can get away with, with Excel. So, mm -hmm. all right. Well, Reed, this has been phenomenal i mean i i love the engagement with the audience i mean you're you're such you've got such a wealth of knowledge too and so you're yeah. easy to talk to this has been great yeah i appreciate it yeah i, I so, enjoy i enjoy the conversation yeah so um where can where can people follow, find you just on linkedin like what's the best way to connect with you um yeah you can find me on linkedin if you feel uh so called look at my code on github and tell me if it could get better um i can <laughs> provide those information later um Occasionally, I don't know, maybe this is a little premature, but I've been working with a few friends uh, using a Discord, which is an app kind of like Slack that allows people to join voice calls. And we've just been going over kind of the basics of Python. Um, Wait, we have, our dis we have a Discord. Uh, so my intern spawned us oh, on the Discord server. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, we've, yeah, I think we've got about I think 200 app. people in it. If you want to come wow. on and do like a Discord, like we, you could tap our audience to get to get like we can help amplify that. Sure. If you want, that would be fun. Um, um, I feel like I would need to make it a little bit more formalized than just <laughs> seven thirty at night for an hour. We're just going to go solve Python I don't problems. Think so. <laughs> See, I think that that is like the old way of thinking, like educationally. I think that a lot of this education stuff is like it's communal. It's pretty like laid mm -hmm. back and relaxed. Like, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it has to be like you don't have to have a shiny PowerPoint slide. And like, right. Is, I agree. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, if, if you want to, we, we can talk off air about potentially um, setting that up. Yeah. I know my, so my intern is looking to learn Python. So yeah. he might be, he might be super interested in that. And we can, we can get, my, he uh, can help amp you and dummy. get more people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, Reed, this has been awesome. Haley, thank you so much for being on. And everyone in the live chat, thank you so much for all the questions. Yeah. That has made our conversation so much richer. All right. Well, yeah. we're going to sign off. So. Thank you, and I'll see you guys later. Bye. Thanks. Bye.